adrenal glands as we continue with the endocrine system. Now remember what, why these are called adrenal glands because the kidneys are the, the renal glands, right? And they have the ureters going down to the bladder. And the adrenal gland is kind of like a little Santa Claus hat on top. So the renal gland is the kidney and the adrenal gland is adjacent to the renal gland. And really there's no connection physiologically here. I mean, blood, like there's hormones that have to go all the way around the body just to get back to the kidney. It happens all the time. So we'll talk about the cortex of the adrenal gland and the medulla of the adrenal gland, right? So the cortex is, again, you should know by now that cortex means outer or bark. And I always say not bark like a dog, bark like a tree, the outer part. The medulla is the soft, chewy center of any organ technically is called medulla is inside. But the, the kidney has a medulla in the middle and the ovary has a medulla in the middle and the cortex on the outside, just like the brain, sort of, the cerebral cortex, but the medulla, you know, is way down. So they're separate glands within one gland. In fact, the adrenal cortex is derived from mesothelium, which is about muscle and, and epithelial tissue. And the medulla is ectoderm embryologically. And that's the same as the nervous system. So remember right off the bat, adrenal medulla is gonna have that neuroendocrine connection. So neural tissue. And what's the neurotransmitter end, the hormone? is epinephrine or norepinephrine, right? Epinephrine could be a hormone or a neurotransmitter. Norepinephrine could be either as well. And another name for that, both of those is adrenaline and noradrenaline. I like to call the hormone adrenaline. I don't know if that's 100% correct in textbooks, but I just, it just makes it easier for me. So here's some memorization, the cortex, which we might've talked about already, but there's three layers or three zones. And, and this is showing you in the outer to inner. Glomerulosa is the outermost. And then fasciculata is the inner one. And I think that's the biggest one, which it is. And then the reticularis is the, oh, we don't need this, right? And the reticularis is the one that's most inner. And we'll see what they do. Let me just see if I can get rid of this. I don't know how to get rid of that. Let me stop the show for a second. Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. Let's see if it changes anything. I like the closed caption, but it gets in the way. So the zona reticularis is the innermost. So we, we heard about a hormone from the anterior pituitary called adrenocorticotropic hormone, remember cortex. Tropic is about growth and production hormone. So ACTH will target all three layers in one way or another. So we're gonna learn and you're gonna memorize what zona glomerulosa secretes, what fasciculata and reticularis and some of the fancy names for it. So here's the histology. I know you did endocrine in lab, so I don't know if you looked at the adrenal gland. Uh, histology, but you can see that there's three, this is the outside. And, and most glands have a capsule on it, like the skin of a tomato. So this connective tissue capsule. So the glomerulosa fasciculata is the largest and then the reticularis. And then you have the separation between the cortex and the medulla. And this is what it looks like. You see specialized cells in the medulla. And you know already that's gonna be neural related. So hormones that are steroids. Remember steroids, are based on cholesterol. So all three zones actually secrete a steroid of a, of a different sort. So the zona glomerulosa secretes what's called mineral corticoids. Now minerals are mostly sodium and potassium. So you're gonna hear of a hormone called aldosterone, which ultimately is gonna target the kidney again, and it's gonna retain sodium into the blood. When, and when I say retain, means that not peeing it out because the kidneys either gonna absorb or reabsorb or they're gonna excrete. So something like aldosterone is gonna hold on to the sodium. And remember, wherever sodium goes, so does this buddy water. So that'll retain water as well. 
Now, aldosterone is going to excrete potassium, excrete. Sometimes they call it secrete too, but I like excrete better because it's going to wind up in the public sewer system at Chipotle where aldosterone is going to reabsorb. I like to say reabsorb because it's been filtered out in the kidneys because the kidneys function to filter your blood. Yeah, so the zona glomerulosa, the outermost, is all about mineral corticoids and especially aldosterone, which is a steroid based on cholesterol. Now, this one's a big one, the second one, the zona fasciculata. Now, you might've heard of glucocorticoids because if you haven't figured out, our body is really involved in maintaining glucose levels in our blood. So glucocorticoids, of course, are gonna increase blood glucose. Let me just solve the mystery about that right away. Glucocorticoids, if they're released from the adrenal cortex, in the presence of ACTH, of course, are going to increase your blood glucose. And they come from that large, or they, those hormones come from that large area called the zona fasciculata. So a good example is cortisol, right? And cortisone, and again, steroids. And remember, I probably mentioned that this is the most, first of all, it's an anti-inflammatory. So it decreases the immune system. And it's also catabolic when it comes to proteins and glycogen too. Sometimes they call this the stress release hormone. Stress hormone, which is completely appropriate, as I always say, when you're in stress, but you can't have this being released constantly. Or it's, it's gonna lower your immune system. It's going to break down your glycogen. It's going to increase your blood sugar. And that is not good health-wise. But again, at first, completely appropriate. So now there's- Is that why- question? Professor, I'm sorry. Can I ask you a quick question? Sure. About the cortisol. Is that why people gain weight? Is because of the constant release of it and the insulin spiking? Yeah. Yeah. They, they tend to, first of all, gain more water weight. And, uh, but over time, you eventually won't be able to use your glucose if you become diabetic, and so you might ultimately lose weight. But you're gonna see a condition called Cushing syndrome, which really causes you to gain weight at first if you have a problem. It depends on what the problem is. Are you getting uh, extrogenous um, cortisone or is the problem with your zona fasciculata of your adrenal cortex? So they tend to, yeah, bulk up, but it's not so much the the sugar, it's the inflammation and the inflammatory response. And it can lead to blood clotting. It releases to edema, leads to edema, which again, most of it's water weight. And if it's a problem with your ACTH, then on top of it, you have excess sodium in your blood and in your ECF and excess glucose. So again, you'll see that a condition called Cushing's is excess release of glucocorticoids. And they do tend to gain weight at first, yes. Now, zona reticularis is about androgens, like testosterone is a, an androgen. And this is a, a form of, of an androgen, DHEA. And again, this is released in females too, which is based on cholesterol. Androgens are based on cholesterol. So females release androgens from their adrenal cortex specifically the zona reticularis, which I might have made a point where when females are low in estrogen, you may have this released because the cholesterol and testosterone can be converted to estrogen by the liver. So this is probably the most important reason that both male and female release this androgen from the zona reticularis. Now in, in males, it really doesn't make any difference because they have the testes to release all that testosterone, especially during puberty, as you're getting into those years of having your spermatogenesis and sexual reproductive um, organs and, and cells in the testes are being produced and matured. So it really doesn't matter, you know, if, if for the, to the male about the zona reticularis and the androgens, because they have so much testosterone going up. 
Yeah. So if this is some of the functions of cortisol. Again, this is not going to sound good. Like you want to break down proteins. Now, there's no reason at all for that to happen this day and age. You don't want this to happen unless, of course, you, you are starving. You, you, don't, you don't get any glucose into your body or fats. So what this is going to do is cause gluconeogenesis, right? Which is the production of glucose from other nutrients like amino acids, especially amino acids. So that's the only reason that that would happen. And we don't want that to happen. Of course, it's going to raise glucose levels to get blood, to get glucose to your brain so your brain can, brain can function. It makes sense for lipolysis, right? It, st it stimulates the breakdown of, of, of fat, but for the only reason to get glucose into your, into your blood, to use it for energy. Now, this goes back to Chris's question. Now, well, now you're saying, no, well, that's going to break down fat, which is stored in your adipose tissue, and you probably lose weight. Well, yeah, maybe at first, but then what are you going to do with all that excess glucose? your liver is going to have to convert it back to adipose. And then if you can't use the glucose, then later on, if you become diabetic, then you're probably going to lose weight anyway because then you have to go back to using the, the lipids, the fatty acids for energy. Are you following that? That's, see how that could happen? And you should understand all of that because we did all that with cellular metabolism. Yeah, it's really important. So exogenous means that you're taking uh, steroids, uh, catabolic cortisol, glucocorticoids, right? Because you need to suppress an inflammation, you know, and sometimes they give you this for severe pain from nerve injuries. Of course, they're gonna give it to you if you have tissue transplant, of course, they're gonna put you on that for long periods of time. Maybe if you have a respiratory condition to cause anti-inflammation, anti-inflammatory because you wanna increase your function, quality of life, but it has a lot of side effects. And pretty much you should understand that now. Yeah. So and it's based on the glucose, among other things. But of course, it's going to lower your immune system. It's going to lower your immune system. So again, I took out some slides, if you looked at just so, because I think the last slide show I showed you with the thyroid and all that was a little more than we needed to know for this um, test. So this is the zones showing cholesterol, again, is used to... You don't have to know every step of this, but you can see how they kind of all match up. You know, it depends on what they're making. So the mineral corticoids, and there's other ones besides aldosterone. And in the zone of uh, fasciculata, cortisol or corticosteroid, sterone is another glucocorticoid. And then the androgens, right? the DHEA. You can learn that big word if you want. Uh, some people take this actually um, and when they're low in testosterone, males especially. And sometimes there's other chemicals that raise this in your body, which is appropriate when you need it, of course. And androstenedione, or stenedione, and that's another androgen. But most of the androgens, the best androgen we know is testosterone, which is released from the testes, which is also... A steroid, of course. So this is from the testes. So in, in the males, it's it's a massive amount of androgens. But no, take note that the female can release androgens from their zona reticularis or their adrenal cortex. Excellent. So now the medulla or medulla, however you want to say it, and this is about adrenaline, right, or noradrenaline, also known as norepinephrine and, nor and epinephrine. And you know this is all sympathetic, right? We did the nervous system in great detail. And you should know what the sympathetic, of course, and I know you do, all right? So why does it last 10 times longer? Because this is endocrine now. This is not um, neurotransmitters. So neuro is very quick, lightning fast, electric, where endocrine, like. Um, adrenaline in the blood is slower, longer lasting. Yeah. So here's some typical sympathetic target areas like cardiac muscle. Remember? Cardiac muscle. So it's going to increase your cardiac output by increasing your heart rate and increasing your contractility. Actually, you should know a lot about the heart. And respiratory rate, 
Respiratory, of course, is about getting oxygen in and carbon dioxide out. In fact, carbon dioxide buildup is more of a, a driving force of your respiration rate than is the oxygen deprivation. So again, you need the oxygen, of course. So the oxygen has to get into your blood, as you know all about that from doing the circulatory system. It does that through the lungs, of course. So the rate of respiration will increase. And mental alertness, because you're getting all that nice blood flow diverted. Remember the little arterioles that uh, dilate to get the blood into the areas, especially the brain. Of course, they vasoconstrict in peripheral to re, uh, increase your blood pressure. But dilation is increasing blood flow because it's all about the radius of the, the lumen of the vessel. So this is all sympathetic, fight or flight, and elevate your metabolic rates so you can bust out more ATP quicker. Yeah. And that's always in conjunction with thyroid hormone as well. because That's a pretty big uh, elevator of your metabolic rates. So you should know a lot about epinephrine, norepinephrine also known as adrenaline and noradrenaline. Stress, all right, here we go, stress. Nobody has this, we're all so calm. Got the adrenal gland, nothing going on, right? But real stress now, and again, we know about the bear in Central Park and the coyote, whatever is bothering me while I'm eating my burrito, but you know, there's worse stresses than that, I guess, and there's stress that can come from your cerebral cortex, just, just worrying. So when you have increased stress, it really should say CRH. CRH is released, right? And where's CRH released from? I bet you can all tell me. This is from the hypothalamus, right? Hypothalamus. Which really is the master, come on. So the hypothalamus is gonna stimulate the anterior pituitary to release ACTH. And ACTH is going to target what? The adrenal cortex. And you saw that the adrenal cortex, the most of it is the zona fasciculata, which makes glucocorticoids and releases them. So this is really where it could start, stress. You know, but, but you got to think of other stress too. It, it's not just, you know, the, the bear or, you know, being deployed to, to Iraq during a war. I mean, of course, there's, you know, uh, abuse, domestic abuse, child abuse, all these things that can create stress. Having surgery creates inflammation and stress in your body by releasing these hormones. So again, uh, CRH is from the brain. ACTH is from the anterior pituitary. So general adaptation syndrome. And, and it's important and it's, it's completely appropriate at first. So you know that the first thing that's going to be released during stress and adaptation is the neurotransmitter, norepinephrine, or epinephrine, right? Because that, that has a response, a quick response, and it's very lightning fast. But then oh, the next thing is these cortisol release from CRH, ACTH, anterior pituitary to the adrenal cortex. So it depresses or inhibits the immune system. So it doesn't over, over respond to the initial output because the initial output is inflammation. Like imagine having surgery, right? How that causes inflammation in your body or other sicknesses, right? So chronic stress, this is the problem. This is the problem because you don't want release of norepinephrine as a neurotransmitter and a hormone in the form of adrenaline for long periods of time because Again, there's studies that say that, you know, the excess release of cortisol could, could affect your decision-making, first of all, and actually changes your EEG waves to something that's not what you need for making decisions, like beta waves will turn into what's called uh, theta waves, which are slower wavelength. So again, it can cause problems in thinking and making a decision. And of course, appetite. And then there's depression, which has been proven you know, over time, uh, and that affects your brain negatively in other ways. And, uh, and depression, of course, could be a lack of serotonin and anxiety could be excess glutamate or, or decrease in GABA, right? And then on top of it, with the learning, 
you can have a memory problem. So this release, which is really because of inflammation, is eventually could lead to dementia, right? Which is loss of memory. It carries all these horrible uh, neuropsychological, and, and, but this is biological. You're seeing the biology of how something like this can happen. So yeah. So what happens when these hormones are released, like epinephrine, of course, you're gonna have glycogenolysis. So the liver, remember the receptors, the, the adrenergic, the beta-2 adrenergic receptors will bind epinephrine or adrenaline. And then you have a, a G protein and adenylocyclase, right? Is activated by that G protein, which cleaves ATP to cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP is the second messenger to make the change. And the change is phosphorylating or you, activating the enzyme that phosphorylates, that is for phosphorylated to break down glycogen. And that increases glucose. And then insulin receptors become resistant because you have high glucose. Sometimes they're down-regulated. Right? We talked about down-regulation. So this is going to be DM, diabetes mellitus type 2. Remember, diabetes mellitus, mellitus means sweet, and sipitus is bland. So there's diabetes mellitus type one and two, but this is a perfect situation where you can become diabetes, uh, have diabetes mellitus type two. And if you're not using that glucose, you're peeing it all out, then you might even lose weight. And you're always hungry, always thirsty, always tired. So ultimately this leads to this, now you're in big trouble because excess um, glucose in your blood is gonna destroy your neurons distally and proximally and make your kidneys really overwork and cause kidney failure ultimately. So again, this is all because of this general adaptation syndrome. So the alarm reaction is the nervous system. So the nervous system, the sympathetic affects the adrenal glands but the adrenal medulla first because that's where the epinephrine is released from. Yeah. And then you have the stage of resistance, right? Is the release of cortisol. And of course your kidneys, you're, you're in sympathetic still. You're, you're still maintaining that fight or flight. And then after a while, your body just breaks down to the stage of exhaustion. So these are the three stages. But remember the first one's really about the nervous system activating the adrenal medulla. Second stage is starting now the release of cortisol CRH, I should say, which starts the whole process. So you should know the axis of CRH from the hypothalamus, ACTH from the anterior pituitary, and then the adrenal cortex releasing the glucocorticoids and mineral corticoids too. And then you're getting sick because so much cortisol is being released that it decreases your immune system, All right? Death, uh, I guess so, yeah. Well, if, if, you're, if you're exposed, you have an opportunistic um, bacteria or virus invades your body at this point, you, you could really be in trouble like COVID-19 if you're in this state um, for whatever reason, you know, whether you have Cushing's or you have a respiratory condition or you just have GAS. So here's some effects. Of course, the adrenal glands, because you're getting so much ACTH from the uh, released that's just targeting the adrenal cortex. And because the immune system is so suppressed, you have atrophy of your lymphatic tissue. And of course the thymus is not so important in the adult, but lymph nodes are, and your spleen is, because these are about maturing your T cells and antibodies, which are important for your immune system. And peptic ulcers, now this is stomach, um, you know, when you have excess release of cortisol or you have stress, of course, the bacteria in your stomach, there's a bacteria called H. Helicobacter, Helicobacter pylori, which loves the stomach because it probably loves acid. And this just proliferates when the immune system is lowered because of stress. So this is really, it's not like an acid is, is digging out the 
the stomach so much. I mean, that happens, of course, but the, it's the, the bacteria that finds a nice little garden to grow in in times of immune suppression in your stomach. And that is really, it's the, it's the bacteria that creates the peptic ulcer and breaks down a lot of the other chemicals that produce mucus. Like uh, I think we mentioned prostaglandins, um, which act as for protection in the stomach and help protect the stomach from being destroyed from acid or the actual bacteria. So this is kind of showing you different ways you have release and there's always like a feedback mechanism. Remember that pretty much all of these feedback mechanisms are negative feedback. So non-specific stress. I mean, this could be, you know, if you're not sleeping, you're just wearing all the time, it's gonna affect your hypothalamus and your hypothalamus is gonna release the CRH. And the more CRH that's released, the more ACTH, the more ACTH is released, the more cortisol is gonna be released. And sometimes it's overwhelming. I mean, it tries to, ne through negative feedback, right, slow these things down. But if this keeps happening, it, the cycle is going to continue. And it takes a remember, this is an endocrine. So this can go up and down very slowly. Yeah. So that's a nice little picture here showing you the axis of that. This is Cushing syndrome up here. Cushing syndrome, high levels of glucocorticoids like cortisol. So you have redistribution of fat. So again, they, they, you get this big lump of fat on your back. They call it the buffalo hump. I'm not sure why that targets that area, but your face gets very round, the moon face. So you might as this is a horrible thing. Like sometimes people who have things like brain tumors, of course, or they're getting chemotherapy on top of the chemotherapy, they're getting uh, cortisone or prednisone or methylprednisone and they they get that moon face you know and it, it happens to people just taking it for other reasons as well as children with asthma you might see it it's kind of sad so it's sustained and high doses of the medicines and these are kind of what the medicines are called like prednisone or methylprednisone uh, dexamethasone prednisolone you might see these in, in people's medicine cabinets uh, unfortunately we might have had to take them ourselves but remember, it's, it's usually for a short period of time. So now here's another way. If you have a tumor that's excess, excessively trophic, which means it's producing too much of the cells that are secreting ACTH from the anterior pituitary. So that's going to excrete, excrete excessive cortisol. So I mean, I think that that's really what Cushing's disease is called when you have excess. So Cushing's syndrome could come from exogenous or so syndrome is just what you see, what it looks like, the signs and symptoms. So I like, I like to call this Cushing's disease when you have a problem specifically with your adrenal cortex and the release of ACTH, which is anterior pituitary. So again, you could have a problem with the adrenal cortex itself, or you could have a problem with the pituitary or the hypothalamus, the area that's CRH. So Again, taking blood levels, finding out where the problem is coming from, where the feedback mechanism is failing. Because usually, you know, the first thing we talked about in this class is homeostasis and how the feedback mechanisms, especially negative feedback mechanism, will maintain homeostasis. And if you're out of homeostasis, it means that the, the feedback mechanisms aren't working. And that's what diseases are. Uh, being out of homeostasis, especially over time. So this is a classic example of the feedbacks. Now, Addison's disease, that's what that says up here. Addison's disease is an insufficiency of the adrenal cortex. So you have low production of aldosterone or low production of cortisol. And then, you, of course, if you have low cortisol, now this is a problem, you have low blood glucose, and that's called hypo, right? Hypoglycemia is low blood glucose. So now you're going to get uh, glucagon being released, and you're going to have glycogenolysis and lipolysis. So, but the other part is the mineral corticoid. So now you have inadequate levels of aldosterone. So you're going to wind up excreting too much sodium and retaining too much potassium. 
that's a problem. Your heart doesn't like that at all, right? Because you need sodium for proper action potential and you need to get the potassium out to have proper de uh, repolarization, right? Don't forget that chapter that we talked about all those parts of the cardiovascular system and the action potentials in the heart muscles. So of course, if you're excreting sodium, you're gonna wind up with dehydration because the water is gonna follow and leave the kidney and dangerously low blood pressure because your blood volume is decreasing. You're losing the water in your plasma. Now, this is, this is one of the things that your body really has to respond to. And it's a horrible snowball effect because every other mechanism in your body is going to do whatever it can to increase your blood pressure. And that's going to put you in sympathetic stimulation all the time. It's a really bad cycle between the kidneys and the heart, really. All right. So here's one reason for this, an, an autoimmune destruction where your actual T cells are attacking the cells of the adrenal cortex. So that's causing the insufficiency of the cortical hormones like the corticosteroids uh, and the, or glucocorticoids or the mineral corticoids like specifically aldosterone. So know the, know the functions of aldosterone and um, cortisol at this point, because now we, we, we studied the zona glomerulosa, which is mineral corticoids, and the zona fasciculata for glucocorticoids. So you need hormone replacement. Sounds simple, right? Sounds simple. But in order to, to maintain it, you're going to wind up in big trouble if you don't replace those hormones. So endocrinology is really important. This says a uh, pheochromocytoma. And this is a tumor of the adrenal medulla, which is producing epinephrine, which is a catecholamine based on the neurotrans uh, based on the amino acid tyrosine. All right. So now this is excessive amounts of adrenaline. You know it's adrenaline now and noradrenaline, and that really will create, cause your body to go into high blood pressure because of vasoconstriction systemically. Tachycardia, increased cardiac rate. And of course your heart's gonna be too, I shouldn't say too strongly, but excessively strong. And that is gonna be an oxygen demand. Yeah, so you've got hypertension is high blood pressure, way above 120 over 80 and other symptoms, of course, which are probably gonna be respiratory and you know, breathing issues and feeling dizzy, syncope all those typical um, circulatory signs and symptoms. And now this, I mentioned this goes on for a long time. I mean, you might not know you have this because there's a lot of reasons for things like we said, like tachycardia, um, high blood pressure, right? So when you look at that, the, this is gonna cause a problem and it's gonna, just like diabetes mellitus, it's gonna give the kidneys a workout because the blood comes into the kidneys at a certain pressure and the kidneys have to filter and then reabsorb. So they need homeostatic blood pressure to really get their job done. So high blood pressure really gives the kidneys a horrible workout and, and can lead to kidney failure. And remember the treatment, catecholamine blockers, beta blockers and alpha blockers, adrenergic, right? Adrenergic is the receptors for epinephrine and norepinephrine, right? or adrenaline, you know, it's the same thing. Sometimes they have to take the organ out, right? Or part of it out, surgical removal of if it's one adrenal gland, hopefully that, that's, and that's usually the way it happens where one adre adrenal gland has the female chromocytoma. So there's a question or two on the test on pheochromocytoma, but not a lot. So this, this, is, it's, this test is pretty comprehensive of pretty much everything we talked about. So it's really straightforward, great learning outcome for the endocrine system. Again, back to exogenous, but what we have to take, the prednisone, the prednisolone, dexta, uh, dexta methasone, or sometimes there's um, methyl prednisone, or just cortisone. They all have different names. It depends on how they packaged in the drug companies and pharmacies, insurance companies, and all that. So these are anti-inflammatories. 
So they're suppressing your blood and cell mediated uh, immune cells, right? So it really lowers your immune system, right? So again, you're using these corticosteroids for respiratory conditions like asthma, sometimes severe allergies, sometimes in conjunction with pneumonia or horrible conditions like tuberculosis or emphysema. Um, if you have an autoimmune disease, this means your immune system is overactive, right? So they'll give you an anti-inflammatory to decrease your immune response. Again, there's going to be side effects, but at least it'll stop what's going on. Now people will feel better, like somebody with rheumatoid arthritis or rheumatism, as they call it. They'll give them bouts of cortisone. But again, the, you become a Cushing syndrome person if you take excess of these. So again, you take you, you take it as a again I mentioned before transplanted tissue because your body's going to reject the transplanted tissue. Again, there's some uh, questions about um, blood types, but that's that's a little different, of course, on the exam, which I did probably when I recorded the blood. So the thyroid and parathyroid glands. Um, and hopefully there'll be a picture here. This is in your neck. Like here's your larynx. Like in males, this is the Adam's apple. And you have a lot of big piece of cartilage and you have this gland, the thyroid gland. It has a little island in the middle called the isthmus. And it has two lobes generally, very vascular. Now the parathyroid hormone uh, uh, glands or in the back of the thyroid, they're, they're really not connected except physically, but they're not connected directly. So here's some cartilage. You might see this in the book, the different cartilage that are in your larynx, because your larynx is where your voice box is, and that's behind all this. And the trachea is your windpipe. So your esophagus is behind all this, where the food goes down. So the windpipe is right in here. You have your vocal cords are back here. So the thyroid gland is anterior in the front. And they're connected by this little island called the isthmus, the two lobes. Every once in a while, people have three lobes of the thyroid. So this is an interesting thing, the thyroid. Again, I went through this with my wife, which is a horrible thing. But you know, you, you get to know how the thyroid works a little bit better and pathology of it. So um, this is one place where the hormone is stored for long periods of time. And they, they're stored in these follicles right, in the cells produce by roxin, which is the hormone, that's T4, tetraiodothyroxin, which is T4. So this is the hormone we see in our blood when we get tested for thyroid hormone. So the colloid is a bunch of fluid and proteins. That's where the thyroxin is being made inside the follicles in the colloid. And outside the follicles, you have parafollicular cells. And that secretes calcitonin. And I probably mentioned this last time, this is like the antagonist for calcium homeostasis. So calcitonin decreases blood calcium. It helps build bone too, when you think about it, because the, the calcium goes into the bone, not out of the body. So this is the takeaway here. The follicle cells produce the thyroid hormone thyroxin and the parafollicular cells they produce and secrete calcitonin. Sometimes they call them C cells. And that's all about calcium homeostasis. Very important, the difference between those two. Here's a great picture. Again, I don't really, not happy looking at this after what happened to us, but it's kind of cool to see the, you know, what the thyroid looks like and the colloid where the, the there's gonna be a, a iodine in here. You really need iodine to make thyroid hormone and here's your follicles and here's your parafollicular cells. The fo follicular cells are around here. Parafollicular, para means around. So here's a good area of parafollicular cells. Remember follicular cells make and secrete the thyroxine, T4, and parafollicular cells make and secrete calcitonin. So thyroglobulin, and this is within the colloid, helps build the 
the thyroid hormone. And that's why you need iodine, which is oxidized to iodide, of course. So iodine is what attaches to the tyrosines. That's where you get T4 and T3. T3 has three iodines, T4 has four. So one iodine is mono, a mono iodotyrosine and diiodotyrosine, which is how it starts. But ultimately it's gonna be triiodotyrosine and tetraiodotyrosine. And that's what these are gonna be T3 and T4. And that's your takeaway here. You put those two together and you get triiodothyronine and now it's called thyronine. Thyronine, so that's the real word. And this is also known as thyroxine T4. And there's more T3, because this is what's happening in the cells. T4 is what you find in the blood. So again, without T4, you don't get T3. And they're bound to thyroglobulin. So once it gets to the thyroid gland, once TSH, remember TSH is released from the anterior pituitary targeting the, targeting the follicular cells of the thyroid gland follicular cells, not the, not the calcitonin producing cells, the parafollicular, the follicular cells. So the thyroid hormone can be secreted into the blood and looking for normal homeostatic levels of thyroid hormone. So this is what it does. This is what thyroid hormone normally does. And first thing is anabolic. I think everything is is anabolic at first, except for cortisol. So anabolic is increasing protein synthesis. And for some reason, probably because of the way it's designed with the thyroid globulin, thyroid hormone is lipid soluble. So it gets into the membrane, goes in and does the job to increase tr transcription. It gets into the membrane easier because it's lipid soluble and also into the blood brain barrier. Real important to maintain the nervous system and maturation, of course, in younger cells. So uh, younger people, I'm sorry. So having the right amount of thyroid hormone as a child is very important. You'll see conditions that can be deadly if there's low thyroid hormone. And it increases your metabolism by increasing cellular respiration. It speeds up the making of ATP which is really elevating the basal metabolic rate. It also increases or upregulates your catecholamine receptors. What does that mean? So this increases your adrenergic receptors. And what are adrenergic receptors for? For epinephrine norepinephrine. So it's very sympathetic. This is why you increase. And you're going to see with the conditions that people with hyperthyroidism tend to have faster metabolisms and be skinnier. And they're hot all the time and the type A personality, whatever that means, where they're really, you know, uptight and on top of things. And hypothyroidism is the opposite. Less um, stimulation of fight or flight. This is calcitonin up here. Let me just get that out of the way. So you can see calcitonin now is different. This is not from the follicle cells. This is from the parafollicular cells. And they're producing and secreting calcitonin, which is about calcium homeostasis. So it keeps calcium in the bone. That's why it says it inhibit dissolution. Dissolution, right, right. Another word for that is resorption. It's an R, resorption. So it's inhibiting this though, it's stopping the breakdown of like dissolving calcium from the bone into the blood. So it's actually the opposite. So it wants to keep calcium in the bone. And also if the blood calcium is high, calcitonin is gonna cause excretion of calcium in the kidneys, excretion. So again, that could cause a problem in the kidneys if that's in excess calcitonin. It's good for your bones, but you really tell you the truth, your body doesn't care about your bones, like how dense they are. 
because we need calcium for so many other things. We need it for muscle contraction. We need it for, as you know, nerve conduction, blood clotting, reproduction, fertilization. So blood calcium levels are very important, just like blood glucose levels, homeostasis, really important. So here's some problems with the thyroid. Now you need iodine. And again, I mentioned this last time that again, in this country, we don't have a problem getting iodine because everything is iodized because probably what happened a long time ago when there were decreases in thyroid hormone. So, and this is why I mentioned that the, the thyroid stores the hormone and the thyroglobulin in those follicles. So if you're not making usable hormone, you're gonna get this huge growth of the thyroid and it's called a goiter. I think there's a picture coming up of a goiter because of uh, iron deficiency in goiter. And now if you don't have the, th the hormone in the blood, you can have low thyroid hormone. And it's gonna, of course, it's the opposite of sympathetic. It's gonna lower your metabolic rate, which is gonna cause you to gain weight and be sluggish, not type A personality. Is that type B personality? I don't remember those personality types. And poor ad adaptation to cold stress. So you're gonna get cold or give me that blanket. Or is the hyperthyroidism, get that blanket off me. And then sometimes a hypothyroidism is mixed with a word, mixed, get it? Mixed with a word called myxedema, which is fluid in between the tissues, subcutaneous fluid within the tissues, myxedema. And again, that's part of the weight gain. There's the water weight. This you should know, the term Graves' disease is hyperthyroidism, just the opposite of myxedema, right? And then this is the scary one now. Cretinism, cretinism, cretinism is, again, you have no thyroid hormone, hypothyroidism, especially in, in the pregnant and in the, in the baby, right? Or the fetus. And this, again, you cannot mature a brain if you don't have your thyroid hormone. So your brain is not going to develop. And you can't live, this, this is not sustainable with life. This, you have to get thyroid hormone or you're not going to survive in this case of a newborn with hypothyroidism. So basically the newborn hypothyroidism is called cretinism. So this is just showing you um, the problem with iodine. Again, causes a goiter because you have low, you have low levels of T3 and T4. So you're not going to have so much negative feedback. So the the thyroid gland, especially the follicle cells, the follicular cells, are going to make massive amounts of of thyroid binding globulin hormones. With but without the iodine, they can't be they can't make the actual hormone. So it just gets huge because again, this is where it's stored. So this is a, an example of a goiter that could go very fast. Now, is it treatable? Yeah, yeah, but not this late. Now, who knows, this, this could be from a, a developing nation or somebody has a problem with the thyroid itself with using iodine. So again, this is called an endemic goiter. You might see that as one of the questions endemic goiter is caused by low iodine. Yeah. Now, why Graves' disease? Again, here we go again with an autoimmune disorder. And they're binding to the receptors for in the anterior pituitary and then causing massive growth. Now, this is hyperthyroidism. This is a thyroid goiter. goiter. And you have an excess of secretion of hormones. Now, this is, again, might not have anything to do with the, the iodine all the time. This, this is, you know, again, autoimmune or possibly a, the tumor even causing this excess. Of course, that we find out right away. So TSH levels are low, but then you have increased because of the feedback. Again, you get huge amounts. So you have the thyrotropin receptor antibodies grow and secrete thyroxin and that's the hormone so that's hyperthyroidism and here's some of the signs and symptoms of hyperthyroidism um very uh, conscious of the heat this is the one get the blanket off of me put the air conditioner on because of the tachycardia you're going to get um you could get arrhythmias 
definitely tachycardia. It should tachycardia is the number one thing here. And that could lead to arrhythmias or a, a palpitation is more of a sign of symptom, but you have to confirm if it's an arrhythmia by using the EKG, of course, as you know. And this ophthalmopathy, uh, ophthalmopathy, it's really an edema in the back of the eye where your eyes kind of bulge. I think we got a picture coming up of that too. And I like exophthalmus better. And that's the condition of the bulging eyes because of this edema that takes place behind the eyes. And I'm not really sure how that happens. Ophthalmopathy, exophthalmopathy. Thalmus, tough to spell, good thing it's not a written test, right? So this is the most common cause of hyperthyroidism, remember autoimmune, right? And it's, it seems like everything with the thyroid is more common in women than in men, don't know why. It's a fairly mild case of exophthalmus, uh, bulging of the eyes, like she's just in a relaxed position. It's not like, what do you mean Chipotle is closed? You know, it's, it's not like she's surprised. This is the way in a resting position. All right. What do you mean there's no decaf at Starbucks? So this is good comparison. You know how I love these tables because there's a good learning outcome. Helps you for the exam. Uh, the difference between hypothyroid and hyperthyroid. It all makes sense. I don't think anything should really, this is a little different here. Like hypothyroid, your skin is coarse and dry, and these have normal, all right? Absent sweating in hypothyroid. This makes sense. In hypothyroid, I have a little problem with um, gastrointestinal, all right? Where these are more, have more excess uh, diarrhea possibly versus constipation. And everything else kind of makes sense nervous versus apathy. And of course, this is the main thing, T4 levels. So it's very simple. The difference between hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism. Now the parathyroid glands, and they really have only one function and that's the opposite of calcitonin. So the parathyroid glands are basically the evil cousin of calcitonin. Remember, calcitonin is released from the thyroid gland, parafollicular cells around the follicle cells. So this is a posterior view of what we saw before with the thyroid cartilage. So this is behind, if you had the chance to look behind, and you can see the um, common carotid arteries coming up here and big blood flow. So here's the glands and there's usually two on each side. Sometimes there's just one, sometimes there's three. So, but most of the time there's four glands Embedded too, it's actually embedded. So again, when like the surgeon had to take my wife's thyroid gland out, they had to keep these in, which is amazing. And make sure they were all cool. And then they can remove the thyroid gland and these are still functional. And they have to keep an eye on your blood calcium though, once you have a, the thyroid gland removed. So this is posterior and you can see the parathyroid glands and they're gonna release a hormone, simply parathyroid hormone, PTH. And PTH, parathyroid hormone, is gonna increase blood calcium. Hence the evil cousin to calcitonin. So here we go. And this does, now this, this gland does not use the hypothalamus. It's got its own mechanism. It's important. It's important you know, to, to sense the calcium levels in your blood, right? So it, it responds to decrease blood calcium, of course, because it's gonna increase ultimately, it's gonna increase the blood calcium. So the parathyroid glands are gonna release PTH, here it is, in the presence of decreasing blood calcium. It's gonna target the bone and that's gonna, they call it a dissolution of your calcium phosphate crystals. <clears throat> so PTH is gonna, basically take the calcium out of the bone by re resorbing it, not reabsorbing it, resorbing it, a dissolution, dissolution of the calcium that goes into the blood. And calcium is gonna not PV, it's like the opposite of calcitonin. 
the kidneys are going to reabsorb the calcium, not pee them into the, the bathroom at Chipotle, right? So there's less calcium in the, um, the urine, probably less chance of kidney stones as well. But also, the, don't forget about the phosphate. The PTH wants to get rid of the phosphate. So it increases reabsorption of calcium, but wants to get rid of the phosphate. So definitely, it, so put it this way, if you have excess release of PTH, you're probably going to wind up having osteopenia, which is low bone density, which ultimately can become osteoporosis, which is basically a form of osteopenia with a primary cause that usually is hormonal, usually. So what time is it? Let's see, 2.33, we'll, we'll introduce a little pancreas. This we talk about a lot, right? The pancreas, kind of introduced this already. Pancreas is mostly exocrine with digestive enzymes, but we want to talk about the pancreas as far as uh, endocrine gland. And that's the Langerhans cells or the islets of Langerhans and other endocrine glands. So it's mostly exocrine, but we're talking about the endocrine cells. And this is pretty simple. I think we talked about this. Uh, it, within the islets of Langerhans, and there should be a nice picture coming up, they release glucagon. Glucagon is going to increase blood glucose. So now you got to remember this. Increasing blood glucose means that glucagon is going to cause gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis, right? Insulin is the opposite. So these guys are evil cousins too, or girls who have got insulin. So the beta cells are what produce and secrete insulin. Insulin is going to decrease blood glucose. It's going to inhibit glucose neogenesis. It's going to stimulate glycogenesis and inhibit glycogenolysis. So insulin is going to increase the production of glycogen in the liver and skeletal muscle and muscle. So they're completely opposite, just like calcitonin and PTH. So know those well. It's a good learning outcome. Can't believe how many hormones you guys are learning. So again, this is the, if you take, this is the parenchyma of the pancreas. They took the stomach out. The stomach's gone. It's attached here to the beginning of the small intestine, which is the duodenum, where a lot of stuff happens in here. We could talk about that. So again, this is the parenchyma. Parenchyma is functional tissue of an organ with the cells, but you can't see them, right? This is, you know, gross anatomy, which means you're looking at it with the naked eye. And then if you looked at it under a microscope, you'll see that the parenchyma is made of very specialized cells in these little areas, patches called the islets of Langerhans. Beta cells, remember, produce and release insulin. Alpha cells produce and release glucagon. Yeah, but most of the pancreas is exocrine and the exocrine uh, digestive enzymes go into the duodenum along with bile from the gallbladder and the hepatic duct, which comes from the liver, like the liver is up here. So again, that's mostly exocrine, but endocrine, and here's another thing, just like the parathyroid gland, the pancreas does not need releasing hormones or inhibiting hormones from the hypothalamus or, or the anterior pituitary. So there's no control there. Just the thyroid hormones, the follicular hormones are controlled by the anterior pituitary, which is controlled by the hypothalamus. So that's another takeaway you should get from this. So the feedback mechanism happens within the pancreas itself. Doesn't need a control center from the hypothalamus. <clears throat> insulin, I mentioned this a lot, right? Insulin, again, type one diabetes, right? Which we'll talk about soon, is no insulin at all. They can't produce insulin. So the problem is autoimmune of the beta cells of the islets of Langerhans of the pancreas. So this is the hormone, hormone that really re regulates your blood glucose. Right, so again, you know about the beta cells. So when, you know, sugary or carbohydrate meal, that's normal, you know, for people without diabetes, if you eat something that has, you know, glucose, ultimately, right? Of course, any carbohydrate 
whether it's sucrose, which is simple uh, disaccharide, or table sugar, right, which is really an empty calorie that you get in all your candies and all that. So insulin is going to spike once it senses the level of, of glucose, which is a carbohydrate, which you know very well. So it's going to lower blood glucose. Yeah. But how? How does it do it? That's the thing. So insulin it needs a receptor. Insulin, remember we talked about this last time, is a, a polar molecule. It's based on protein, right, or polypeptide. So again, it needs a receptor on the cell. So vesicles, that is GLUT4 carriers, are really about glucose, right? GLUT4 GLUT carriers are the carriers attached to the receptors for insulin. So insulin, once insulin binds, the glucose can be carried into the cell through facilitated diffusion, right? Facilitated diffusion. So glucose uses these channels, which are really part of the receptor complex. And where does this happen? Adipose tissue, skeletal muscle, and of course, the liver, right? Remember, these receptors are also proteins and they can be downregulated or upregulated depending on the presence of insulin or our presence of glucose in some cases. And this is so only a certain number of these. So again, if you keep eating these sugary meals, if we're hanging out at Dairy Queen all the time, every day, eight hours a day, then these glute re four receptors or channels, I should say, and receptors for insulin are gonna be that enough is enough. We're, we're gonna downregulate. And next thing you know, you're in diabetes mellitus type two. So again, most cells have these receptors and these carrier channels, facilitated diffusion, remember. So indirectly stimulates glyco glycogen synthase. So you're building glycogen. So that's called, right? Glycogenesis. And it's not breaking down adipose tissue, it helps store it. So that's called lipogenesis. Yeah, so, so if you have, even if you're eating excess carbohydrates, ultimately they're gonna be converted to light lipids and be stored as fat. Your, your, your liver has a way of doing that. So again, the keto diet is an extreme example of lowering your glucose to use the fats and not store the fats. Of course, you're going to lose weight, but it is a completely healthy. In some ways, it is. In some ways, it's not. So glucagon, back to the evil cousin, right? It's antagonistic, right? Like the Shakespeare, right? The agonist and antagonist depends on what, what's going on. Alpha cells, glucagon. Right, so this raises blood glucose to normal range. So this is going to cause uh, glucogeogenesis. So if it has to, it has to use amino acids to increase blood glucose. Now insulin would never do that, and this also would be glycogenolysis. It's starting to make sense, right? This makes sense to you, folks. And hopefully they work together to give you a homeostatic normal glucose range, which I think, what did your book say? Like uh, 70 or so to 115 milligrams per deciliter of blood. Different labs and different books use different numbers, but it's pretty close. They're all pretty close. It depends if you're, if you're predisposed to diabetes type two, then you really have to be careful. So glucagon, again, causes glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis and lipolysis, the opposite. So we, we're dumping the fatty acids into the blood in case we run out of glucose. We have that excess nutrient to make ATP. So DM, diabetes mellitus, get this out of the way. Um, 
Now, fasting. So this is not after going to Dairy Queen, of course. This is, you know, after you haven't eaten anything and your blood glucose level is still high. So I guess you could say they're kind of interchangeable, hyperglycemia and diabetes mellitus, but it depends on the cause. You know, you have to get to the cause of this, of the hyperglycemia before you can call it diabetes mellitus. Remember, diabetes mellitus is the sweet one where diabetes insipidus is bland. And yes, they did taste the urine back a couple hundred years ago to find out the difference. I wasn't that, I wasn't around, I'm not that old. I'm pretty close, all right? So the two types, DM type one and DM type two. So DM type one diabetes is usually, usually in younger people, of course, because they have destruction of the beta cells of the islets of Langerhans, and it's usually autoimmune. I believe after all this time, we don't know exactly what causes this and how to stop it. Exactly. You know, all the stuff we know about the insulin and glucose levels. Type two, now you can make insulin, but you have resistance to insulin, meaning like your receptors are, are, are tired, your beta cells are tired of making insulin. So your your tissues that have the receptors are kind of desensitized to the use of insulin. So the sugar never, or the sugar, the glucose never really gets in. All right. So now gestational means diabetes you get when you're pregnant. You get the diabetes, the mother, right? Because the baby's demanding a lot of um, glucose. Now, it could be bad luck. It, it's not based on what you eat sometimes. You could have a completely sound uh, prenatal diet and still get gestational diabetes. So you have to be tested with this. And they do glucose fasting tests, right? Glucose tolerance tests too, because really this is, of course, not type one. This is really just an extension of type two diabetes. 4% of pregnancies have this. So it's always tested for, right? But the insulin that's secreted is not meeting the demand of the, the glucose. So again, the fetus is, is demanding a lot of glucose. I mean, for, for, it's two people, you know that. It's like eating for two, you've heard that. It's kind of true, not the calories, but the think of the nutrients and how they're metabolized now. Yeah. So some of the hormones, that the, the placenta is really how the fetus gets the oxygen in and the carbon dioxide out so they can run their cycles. Of course, you need cellular respiration. So the placenta actually secretes hormones for other reasons that kind of get in the way of, of insulin and glucagon. So it affects the female. And it's, I mean, again, it's treated now. I mean, it still can cause a problem, but this probably was, childbirth was probably one of the leading cause of death a couple of hundred years ago. Again, I wasn't there. I made it, I was, I'm not that old again. But all the things that can go wrong in uh, in those pregnancies, right? Now the pineal gland we met, or for the epithalamus of the diencephalon, behind the third ventricle, of course, which is adjacent to the thalamus, and it secretes and makes a hormone called melatonin, and this one is controlled by our old and good friend, the hypothalamus. So this is about circadian rhythms, light dark cycles, which hopefully when it gets dark, you start releasing melatonin. So again, if you're going out dancing, um, you might have a little problem, especially when you're my age. Again, I, I can't dance, but I try. Okay, so the circadian rhythms based on your inner clock. And we talked about sleep, how important that is. That's where you really need to, to, to regenerate your brain tissue. We really do. You really need to sleep and it never should be overlooked. Okay, it requires melanopsin. So the retina, of course, is the neural tissue where you have your photoreceptors that you could see if it's dark or light, whether you find out about it or not. So again, in relation to the hypothalamus, which is non-cognitive. 
So secretion at puberty, of course, because it's the hypothalamus, <clears throat> jet lag flying out of your time zones and sad seasonal affective disorder. I don't, not so happy in the winter unless I go skiing or, or teach even physiology to you fine people. So seasonal disorder may have something to do with the connection between the hypothalamus and the pineal gland and the limbic system, which you should know pretty much about. So this was about the pineal gland. And there it is. Of course, you don't need to know the chemical formula of melatonin but you could see how it's inhibited during the light of day, right? So again, I saw a really good, you might have seen this on Netflix about sleep and all the different ways to, to get a proper night's sleep or get to sleep without looking at screens and making sure the light is, is dimmed when you need to sleep. Now, if, you, if you're working shift work, um, I, I don't know how many people in here are nurses, but I don't think there's many. But you might have shift, shift work as a PA where you work 12 hours over the night and then go home during the day where it's light out. So your melatonin and circadian rhythm can get interfered with, of course. So here's your biological clock, right? That keeps ticking. And that is in your hypothalamus, really, that controls that. So the connection between the photoreceptors of the retina, your rods, pretty much your bods and cones too. <clears throat> and the output of your medulla oblongata, again, with release of certain chemicals like epinephrine and your reticular activating system is about arousal, waking up. And you wanna deactivate that, of course, not to the point of a coma, but to the point where you can get that rest and get into that delta sleep and REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep and deep sleep which is really important for brain function. Other endocrine glands is what we're gonna talk about. So let me give you the highlights and what I remember from the exam about what's on there. So again, this is mostly digestive, but hormones that are made in the stomach. And the king of all the hormones of the stomach is gastrin. This is the one that sends out the signals to the remaining part of the um, digestive system and secretin and cholecystokinin, also known as CCK, which has to do with pancreatic enzymes and bile being released, uh, again, from the digestive system itself. The gonads, of course, we talk about the uh, ovaries and the testes, testes producing the testosterone and estrogen and progesterone from the ovaries, from the follicles of the ovaries in a place called the corpus luteum, which I think I have behind me as a a background. So production of gametes, gametes, like I said last time, are your sperm and your egg. So that's more exocrine though. The hormonal, the endocrine part is the testosterone, the estrogen, the progesterone. And produce the gametes. And of course you need the hormones to produce the gametes and your secondary sexual characteristics like increase of production of your sexual glands and organs and facial hair and different sweat and all those other things that go along with puberty and, and continue through your childbearing years. The placenta is a, is a nice little bag of hormones. I might've mentioned HCG is released from the placenta. At first it's released from the actual um, implanted blastocyst into the endometrium of the uterus. But now once the placenta forms and the corpus luteum now is, is not functioning anymore because the placenta will take over and produce hormones like somatomammotropin, which is about maintaining the pregnancy and re regulating the pregnancy it may have something to do with the onset of labor. But I think the onset of labor has more to do with cortisol release actually. So the, one of the cool things about the placenta, remember that hormone, anybody know the hormone that's released from the hypothalamus that stimulates and targets the anterior pituitary to release ACTH. That's CRH, right? Corticotropin releasing hormone. So somehow the placenta releases that. So the placenta somehow with the timing in the mix of this long, if you're in jeopardy, maybe you can remember that hormone, 
the CRH is going to be released from the placenta and increase the release of ACTH, which targets the adrenal cortex to release cortisol. So cortisol has been known to bring on right, uh, the, uh, labor. It's not oxytocin, it's cortisol. Why did I put cortisol? I was saying oxytocin, my brain got a little confused there. So CRH is released from the placenta. Crazy, that was amazed me. So we're gonna go through this a bit. Um, this is very interesting because this, this paracrine and autocrine I mentioned last time, I believe, paracrine will release a hormone that's gonna affect its neighboring cell. Autocrine is the cell is gonna release the hormone and, and it's gonna target its own cell, itself. That's auto means self. So we know a bit about these, autocrine and paracrine. That's what it says up here. So short range, of course, if it's the same cell, if it's a neighbor. All right, so the signals, you know, is also the control, really. And the paracrine is a different tissue. That's a control and the target. But the autocrine, the, the sensor and the target are the same cell, or cell type within the tissue. Remember, from the beginning, right, we talked about all the or levels of organization. It's a good outcome. So autocrine, these are examples of autocrine, cytokines, are immune cells, basically, and they regulate the immune cells themselves. Growth, and this is a chemical, right? Chemical, you're gonna hear about cytokines released in inflammatory processes, right? Immune uh, response. Growth factors sound anabolic, right? They increase the cellular division, increase mitosis. So again, these are working on themselves, their own cells based on their own production and need. And wherever they're found, like kinds, lymphokines are in the lymph tissue, Neutro, neurotrophins are within nervous tissue. And they control gene expression, like a transcri uh, transcription factoring, right? Increase uh, cell division, or, or sometimes not, sometimes inhibit cell division. So how the gene is gonna be expressed can be affected by these local hormones, specifically autocrine on themselves. Again, one of my favorite things, the tables and the autocrines, and there's a, we might've talked about some of these. Um, IGFs, I like to say IGFs, because they're really nothing like insulin really, but they're very anabolic. So this is targeted from, from growth hormone in the liver. Nitric oxide, you should know, and oh, this is the one I mentioned is uh, vasodilation, right? dilation of vessels, sometimes anterior, uh, antibacterial when they're involved in macrophages. These are endothelins are severe, probably the most powerful vasoconstrictors, increase blood pressure, right? And again, this will stop, kind of slow blood flow down, really increase the pressure. Here's a growth factor, which is platelet derived and this is kind of cool because the blood vessels have smooth muscle, which are able to regenerate easiest. So again, platelet derived growth factor, like say you have a blood clot in one of your vessels, thrombosis, right? We talked about thrombosis and I talked about what collateral circulation is. So the growth factor involved will, will build up collateral circulation, say around a blood clot. Right, like I said, Route 95 is like a major vessel and you could have a backup on the Harlem River Drive and then you could take other routes to get around that, take Park Avenue or something to go around that. But the cells themselves are regenerating and building their own pathways. So this is very interesting. Like I mentioned uh, last time about, you know, the, um, a widow maker where, where somebody who's younger has less collateral circulation than the older person because of the old blockages they may have had, they have more collateral circulation. So they might live through a heart attack better than somebody who's younger. Myocardial infarction, of course. Epidermal growth factors, of course, are about healing of the skin, right? The epidermis and dermis. Neutro or neuro, why I keep saying neuro, neutro, it's neurotrophins, and this is peripheral nerves, right? Not central nervous system, Schwann cells. 
peripheral. They aid in the regeneration of nerves, nerves like which are bundles of neurons. Bradykinin, this is one you may hear of a lot in your studies. And this is about, a, this is a dilator like NO. So nitric oxide and brady, bradykinin are vasodilators. And here's an interesting one. This is something that's released in cases of asthma or cystic fibrosis or respiratory um, release of and um, immune cells. So increase in interleukins will cause an over response. So this is probably one of the main chemicals that are released when people are affected by a virus like COVID-19. Excess inflammation, macrophage and your lymphocytes, which are immune cells. So this chemical that's released autocrine wise on the tissue itself when it's been infected can be a problem. So prostaglandins, now this, it depends on where they are. So prostaglandins could either be vasoconstrictors or vasodilators. It depends on, on where they are, right? In, in some place like the uterus, prostaglandins are released as, and they're much more vasoconstrictors in low levels of estrogen. Prostaglandins um, in the stomach are, are important for helping produce the mucus. Prostaglandins are an inflammatory reaction. So they are released in inflammation. So these are also released in inflammation. I need you to know uh, prostaglandins because we're gonna talk about some of the medications that block the production of prostaglandins. This is interesting too, this tumor necrosis factor. And this is very valuable in research because the cells are very specialized that release this and usually it's in a tumor and it creates more inflammation. This is one of the reasons why people who have cancer, they, they're given not only chemotherapy or radiation, but they're giving anti-immune uh, medications. Yeah. Here's um, prostaglandins, which really is part of a, here we go, a eicosanoid family. So these are short chains of fatty acids. So they're basically lipids. <clears throat> and the fatty acid that they're part of is arachidonic acid. So the plasma membranes, which are made of biphospholipids, of course, the, and which are fatty acetals. So these eicosanoids that are produced are from the membrane and released from every cell. So these are pretty well studied prostaglandins. So again, leukotrienes involved. Leukotriene is also a eicosanoid. It's not, it's not a, um, always a, a prostaglandin. It could be different depending on the tissue that it's in. And ox oxygenase really is the enzyme. Depends on where they're getting from. Lipooxygenase is the enzyme that produces these eicosanoids like prostaglandins. So this is the enzyme that's going to be affected by medications like anti-inflammatory medications that are non-steroidal. They'll block oxygenase, right? And again, released from most every cell. So cyclooxygenase, we call that COX, will produce the prostaglandins. And there's different types of prostaglandins, right? And what do they do? So again, the oxygenase, this is a specific a, a LOX, you could say, but these are more about inflammation and prostaglandins. This is more about the leukotrienes, which is inflammation. And it could be a, a bronchoconstrictor and a vasoconstrictor, so which is all constricting, depend on the local, um, again, these are autocrine hormones. And the permeability of the capillary, so more things can get in and out, like blood and blood cells and white blood cells and red blood cells sometimes. <clears throat> so prostaglandins, vasodilation sometimes, and some are vasoconstrictors. That's the takeaway here. So smooth muscle contraction, smooth muscle relaxation, depend on where they are. And they help, of course, with not only platelet ag aggregation, but also with um, reproduction, sperm, getting into the cervix and the uterus. Prostaglandins are important for reproduction as well. So again, it depends on where they are. The prostaglandins, are they vasoconstrictors or are they vasodilators? 
But one thing they all are is they cause inflammation, which is an immune response. And we talked about inflammation. So these are important, of course, as, as a vital part of inflammation. So here's the action. They promote pain, you know, the immune system, inflammation, but they can lead to pain and elevated temperature because the chemicals that are released from these cells affect the thermostat, which is your hypothalamus through the blood, of course. So again, they aid in ovulation, but not only in ovulation, they make the area really non um, hostile, more comfortable for sperm. So it's not only an ovulation, but also sperm motility for lack of a better word. So they make it easier for the sperm. You know the story. I talk about it on a Friday night when the, on the 14th day of the cycle, the oocyte, mature oocyte is ovulated and the sperm could find its way. Only, you know, it's a tough mutter. It's got to get up through the fallopian tube through all this mucus and the prostaglandins actually help released by both the female and the male. The male, of course, would be in the semen. So the prostaglandins aid in reproductive system. Yeah. So in the digestive system, they are important for absorption. I think it's the most important thing in movement. So vasoconstriction and vasodilation depend on where it is. So the digestive system is more about vasodilation. And they inhibit secretion of what? Pretty much acid. So they help control the acid in the stomach. And kind of, I don't want to say neutralize, but they protect the, the mucosa from being destroyed by that high acid that's in the stomach because the stomach is the only place in the body that's extremely acidic, like pH below three, might've mentioned that. Sometimes the vagina gets acidic too, but not because of hydrochloric acid, hydrogen ions, of course. Uh, respiratory, again, bronchoconstriction, which kind of decreases the amount of air into the inflammation you know, in something like asthma is a problem when you have excess bronchoconstriction. So dilation, it depends on the condition, of course, if it's bronchoconstriction or dilation, <clears throat> but it's supposed to be there for homeostatic reasons. And circulation, constriction and dilation depends on where, locally or systemically, and the kidneys too. So prostaglandins are really important, well studied, and well used. So here's what we're gonna talk about, um, what inhibits inflammation. And these NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like um, uh, Advil and Motrin or ibuprofen, right? And then you have um, Naproxen And, and aspirin, which is acetyl salicylic acid, are all, and, and naproxen, I think, is a leaf, and aspirin is acetyl salicylic acid. And they're basically block the enzyme cyclooxygenase. So they're, they're COX inhibitors. NSAIDs are COX, which is cyclooxygenase inhibitors, in this COX 1 and 2. Now, the problem here is that if you have low prostaglandin, because you can't take these medications for more than five days in a row, and a lot of people do, but eventually, first of all, they're going to give your kidney a workout. And I notice I don't put Tylenol, which is acetaminophen in here, because they're not, it's not an NSAID, NSAID. So if you lower the cyclooxygenase, you're going to decrease prostaglandins, because that's the enzyme that builds prostaglandins right, from the membranes or arachidonic acid. So that decreased the prostaglandin and that causes excess acid and gastric bleeding, right? And this is what gives you a nice area for that H. pylori to find a little spot and cause something like peptic ulcers because you're taking excess ibuprofen, excess naproxen or excess aspirin, these NSAIDs. Yeah, right, and of course the endomethacan, which you can buy over the counter now as well. They're all COX inhibitors and they're all NSAIDs. So aspirin is an acetyl 
salicylic acid, not acetaminophen, that's Tylenol, NSAIDs, and they create problems. So basically the COX-1 and COX-2, um, the ones we saw before are more COX-1 inhibitors. COX-2 inhibitors are medications that are still um, NSAIDs, but these were a prescription and they kind of help out by not affecting the stomach because now it's not affecting the stomach and the kidneys, but these still have side effects and some of them are pretty bad. Celebrex and Vioxx are the COX-2 inhibitors. So the, the ibuprofen, the NSAID, I'm um, sorry, the naproxen, aspirin, or all COX-1 inhibitors, that's why they develop these COX-2 inhibitors to avoid the stomach problems. So if you're on, you know, if you go to the doctor and you have an inflammatory condition where they, they prescribe, like say, uh, prescription strength ibuprofen, you can't keep taking that. They would have to eventually put you on a COX-2 inhibitor to pr prevent stomach problems, to avoid the gastric or kidney related problems. But here's what happened. They created more risk of blood clotting and occlusion of vessels, which lead to CVA, of course, you know, cerebrovascular accident or myocardial infarction, which is heart attack. We don't use that word anymore, right? Well, you can, but not in this class, <laughs> All right? So they basically were pulled off the market and different, different poisons were used. And, and again, if you have to take it, it's okay, but you just can't stay on these things for too long because every drug has a side effect because they're designed to block a protein that's in this case is an enzyme, cyclooxygenase one or cyclooxygenase two. So they're, they're COX inhibitors. It's kind of scary, yeah. So acetaminophen works a little different because they, they've isolated this isoenzyme, but this is more about fever and pain, but not the inflammation. So again, we're still learning about these leuka, not leuka, well, yeah, sometimes they are leukotrienes, but these eicosanoids. Remember, these are in a class called eicosanoids based on arachidonic acid, which is a fatty acid, about 20, 20 fatty acid chains that are cleaved off of the cellular membranes. Pretty amazing. Right, so leukotrienes, anti-leukotrienes now. So leukotrienes are released in asthma. You'll see this on the exam, I think, where the leukotrienes are inhibited by inhibiting the lipooxygenase. We don't call it LOX, but I should still call it LOX instead of COX. So Singular, you might've heard of, is the um, market brand, or whatever you call that, not non-generic, Singular uh, name brand of an anti-leukotriene, which decreases that arachidonic acid produced hormone that is released during asthma. And in this case, of course, that's a, a bronchial constrictor. So it's, it's, it works opposite, but it's inhibiting the enzyme. And we did enzymes, so you should have a pretty good idea. That was a tough chapter on enzymes. So that made a lot of sense. So again, since I'm recording, I just wanna say that, you know, we're gonna have the exam uh, 80 questions that will be, I could release it as soon as you want it. I don't know if you want to start it today, but it, it'll probably be released at midnight, 80 questions on circulatory system and the endocrine system, all in neatly packaged in your little uh, learning modules, lecture learning modules for exam four, also known as the final exam. And that'll be due from what I have it right now, unless somebody has a real big objection to this, um, it'll be due no later then the 19th of May at 5 p.m. No, 5.30 p.m., Angelina, I'm sorry, 5.30 p.m. Because that's officially the end of our uh, semester. And I believe the semester's over the next day. So again, I'll release that. I'll send a long, boring email about, you know, where you find it, which you probably can do in your sleep right now. And you won't be able to backtrack any questions, multiple choice, very good learning outcome. So do the practice questions and you'll, you'll know what you're talking about in case you're on Jeopardy or, or you do become a PA or professional dancer or um, what, what else are we doing in this class? Anybody? Have any, I love talking about this.